66 million years ago, give or take, a massive asteroid hit Earth in what is now known as Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The effects were devastating. The asteroid created a huge crater, pushing rocks from Earth's crust up into a rim of mountains taller than the Himalayas. It sent gas and dust into the atmosphere, blocking the sun and leading to a 15-year winter. And because of it, Earth lost three quarters of plant and animal life, including tragically the Triceratops and T-Rex. That was Earth's last mass extinction event, and we're currently in the midst of another one, the sixth one in Earth's history to be exact. Maybe that doesn't mean much to you, like we've done okay without the dinosaurs, so it'll be fine, right? But here's the thing, right now, more than 44,000 species are threatened with extinction, including 41% of amphibians and 26% of mammals. And while the other five mass extinction events in Earth's history were because of things like asteroids, volcanoes, temperature changes, and changes in the chemistry of the atmosphere and ocean, this one is all because of people. Hi, I'm Miriam Nielsen, and this is Study Hall Sustainability. Earth is filled with millions of species of plants, animals, fungi, and microorganisms. Having lots of different species is known as biodiversity, or biological diversity, and we can see this diversity all over the planet. On land, biodiversity tends to be highest in rainforests, partly because the climate there is ideal for life. The Amazon rainforest is one of Earth's most biodiverse rainforests, and 10% of the known biodiversity on Earth is found there. In oceans, biodiversity is highest near the coastlines and the equator, where there's a lot of nutrients, it's not too cold, and there's reef systems. The coasts of Southeast Asia and Oceania, in particular, are highly biodiverse regions. These areas are also known as biodiversity hotspots. That means they are a priority for conservation because while they have a lot of species diversity, they also have already experienced a lot of species loss. See, extinction is actually a normal part of life on Earth. Experts estimate that if you had a sample of 10,000 species with no human interference, you could expect one or less of those species to go extinct every 100 years. That's called the rate of background extinction. But with human interference, that number goes way up. And humans have been interfering for a while, like when Dutch soldiers went to the island of Mauritius in the 1600s. They brought cats and other animals with them, which hunted, competed with, and destroyed the habitat of the dodo bird, causing the species to go extinct in 1690. Clearly, they forgot the bell collars for their cats. Dodos might be the most famous human-caused extinction, but people also hunted Stellar's sea cow, a mammal that lived in the Bering Sea, to extinction in 1768. And then people ate so many mussels and shellfish that the Labrador duck no longer had a food source and went extinct in 1870. Since 1900, the extinction rate has continued to go up far outpacing the rate of background extinction. And we've lost the Rocky Mountain locust, deepwater cisco fish, and golden toad, among many others. R.I.P. golden toad. Losing these species is a serious issue because, well, who wouldn't want to live in a world with a dodo bird? But it's also a problem because losing species can throw a lot of things out of whack. Take the African savanna. It's filled with grasses, trees, and everyone's favorite charismatic megafauna, elephants, giraffes, zebras, and lions. It's also filled with less charismatic things like warthogs, and critters we often avoid thinking about like insects and microorganisms. Those elephants and warthogs aren't just hanging out in the grassland because they like the sunsets, though. All these species from the tallest giraffe to the littlest dung beetle evolve together, each with its own niche in the expansive ecosystem. By designating trees as scratching posts or buffet tables, elephants manage the population of trees, shrubs, and vines that grow across the region. Then their seed-filled dung disperses diverse grass species throughout their ranges. These grasses provide food and camouflage for things like zebras. Unfortunately for the zebras, that camouflage isn't perfect, and they might end up as food for predators like lions. Once the lions have had their fill, what's left of the zebras is picked over by vultures and insects. Completing the circle, microorganisms in the soil break down plant and animal matter, providing nutrients for the trees and grasses, and the life cycle continues. All these different species, and many more, contribute to a stable, resilient ecosystem. In some cases, if just one species goes extinct, the other species would likely be able to fill in the gaps to prevent serious consequences like runaway overpopulation or ecosystem collapse. But if multiple species or a key species like elephants were lost, suddenly the savanna might stop being very savanna-y. There wouldn't be anything to trim down the greenery and spread grasses around, and a single shrub might take over, which would leave the zebras without anything to eat. And further up the food chain, lions would go hungry too, and on and on. Biodiversity isn't just crucial for the health of the plants and animals in the African savanna, it's crucial for the health of the planet overall. The African savanna is an important carbon sink, absorbing excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the region provides water, farmland, tourism opportunities, and more for the people living there. From oceans to rainforests, these kinds of unique species and crucial systems exist all over the planet. And we need them for the health and sustainability of Earth and everything on it. But for much of human history, a reliance on nature has turned into a desire to control it, use it, and make a lot of money from it. 
or just let our cats destroy it. After all, cats kill billions of birds each year. In just about every ecosystem on Earth, even in harsh climates and inhospitable terrain, we've cleared land for agriculture, timber, mining, urbanization, and more. We've hunted and fished and picked just about anything that's edible. In fact, people have directly and significantly impacted 75% of land on Earth and 66% of the ocean. Over one third of the land on Earth is used for crops or livestock, and using the land isn't necessarily a bad thing, but not doing it responsibly is detrimental to ecosystems and biodiversity. For example, crops such as corn, corn, rice, and wheat are really adaptable. They can grow almost anywhere, which of course means that people started growing them almost everywhere. They became staples that provide nearly half of the calories we eat. As the world's population grows, the demand for food increases, which means more and more biodiverse forests and habitats are being cleared and replaced with monocultures. Fields and fields filled with just one type of plant. And we see that all over. Even parts of the Amazon rainforest are being cleared and replaced with corn and soybeans. And biodiverse forests across Asia, Africa, and Latin America have been cleared to make way for palm oil plantations. Palm oil is used in everything from shampoo to ice cream, but it comes at the expense of crucial habitats. Between 1985 and 2007, Sumatran orangutans lost around 60% of their key habitat in Asian forests. As a result, orangutans are endangered, and that's disrupting key relationships in these forests. Orangutans eat figs and spread fig seeds throughout the rainforest. Meanwhile, wasps pollinate the figs and lay their eggs in them. So without orangutans to spread seeds, species of fig trees and wasps would be lost, further reducing biodiversity. We're clearing vegetation, drilling into the earth, rerouting rivers, and pushing wildlife out of their habitats to do everything from building housing developments to mining fossil fuels to producing just about everything else we use. All that farming, building, mining, and exploitation directly leads to the extinction of species, and makes it harder for ecosystems to stay balanced and support life. So what do we do about it? Well, the good news is this time it's not like when the dinosaurs went extinct. For dinos, a massive asteroid was heading toward the Earth, and they were powerless to stop it. But we've got some things we can do and enough time to hit the brakes on this mass extinction and keep our cats inside. Some experts estimate we'll have lost 75% of all species within 10,000 years. Others think it could be in a few centuries. Either way, we're nowhere near the point of no return. And luckily, lots of people are already working to protect biodiversity. Crucially, indigenous people make up just 5% of the world's population, but by responsibly harvesting plants, maintaining an off-season for hunting, and creating wildlife sanctuaries and sacred spaces where people and cats can't go, they protect 80% of global biodiversity. Protecting the sovereignty of indigenous populations and prioritizing indigenous land management techniques honed over centuries is a key biodiversity strategy. But we haven't always done that well. In 1916, the U.S. National Park Service established Acadia National Park in Maine, on Wabanaki land. The Wabanaki used the coastal resources like eels, salmon, and sweetgrass for medicine in religious ceremonies and to make baskets. But when the National Park Service took over the land, they banned traditional tribal practices, including gathering sweetgrass. In the Park Service's view, the ban attempted to protect local wildlife. But sweetgrass actually starts to die off when not regularly harvested. So of course, the best way to conserve sweetgrass is to harvest it, the very thing the Wabanaki have been doing for years. In 2016, the National Park Service started to get its act together, allowing parks to make agreements for plant gathering with indigenous nations. And in 2018, the Park Service began considering a proposal to allow the Wabanaki people to harvest sweetgrass again. They released an environmental assessment to the public in 2024 before making a final decision on the proposal. Protecting biodiversity also happens at the international scale. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, has thousands of member organizations, including governments and scientific institutions. Their red list tracks the status of endangered species around the world. For example, it lists the Sumatran orangutan as critically endangered and says that its population is in decline. But the IUCN doesn't just make lists. They also work to protect and conserve species with projects that monitor, restore, and manage ecosystems. Their Conservation projects protect critically endangered species by ensuring access to food, preventing poaching, and reducing human interference. Other organizations are working to change farming practices to reduce monocultures. In Zambia, conservationists are working to rebuild the Catanino Forest Reserve, where miombo trees grow. Since 2001, this area has lost over half of its tree cover to charcoal production. The organization We Forest trains local farmers to plant trees on their land among their crops. Their work is restoring the forest, increasing biodiversity, and helping the local communities see the value of their trees. Ultimately, biodiversity loss is a human problem. One study of more than 34,000 species found that without humans, it would take 18,000 years for the natural extinction rate to match all the species we've killed off in the last 500. We're the ones who have destroyed habitats, overhunted animals, let our cats run wild, and polluted ecosystems, all for our own gain, to grow more food and mine for more substances and make more money. And all that destruction has affected thousands of species of plants and animals. That matters. But in the end, it affects us. And our cats, too. Less biodiversity makes for less stable ecosystems, making it harder 
harder for both natural and human-cultivated plants and animals to survive. That makes it harder to produce food, medicine, and lots of other necessities. And it takes away the natural beauty and diversity of our landscapes, which affects our mental health, eliminates activities like hiking and birdwatching, and robs us of cultural traditions, knowledge, and stories. Sure, we've done okay without the dodo bird and the dinosaurs, but we're not exactly better off. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall Sustainability course and earning college credit from ASU, check out GoStudyHall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment your favorite extinct species, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching, see you next time.